Hello everybody, welcome to Engines of Creation podcast. I'm your host, Christian Mastodonato. In this podcast, I bring together my knowledge in complex systems with my experience in leading technology innovation and new product development to explore how successful products, organizations and ideas emerge. In these thought-provoking episodes, we venture beyond the typical paths of our podcast with Aki Yarvinen, a technologist and designer who brings a unique perspective at the intersection of technology, ethics, philosophy, and spirituality. Aki's rich background spans game design, interactive media, and immersive technologies, and he shares his journey from Finland to the UK, weaving in his philosophical musing along the way. Aki introduces his newsletter, Unexamined Technologist, inspired by Socratic philosophy, and discusses the importance of examining our relationship with technology. He highlights the concept of technological somnambulism, where society sleepwalks through technological advancements without fully understanding their implications. The conversation delves into the magical qualities attributed to technology and the dichotomy between makers and users. Aki emphasizes the need for a more nuanced approach to technology development, one that incorporates ethical and spiritual considerations. He proposes the idea of critical technical awakenings, where technologists are encouraged to integrate spiritual traditions and ethical frameworks into their work. We explore the possibility of creating a new foundation for civilization that respects nature and acknowledges the limits of technology. Aki suggests that indigenous thinking and spiritual traditions can guide us in building technologies that promote human flourishing and harmony with the environment. Throughout the episode, Aki underscores the importance of self-inquiry, introspection, and a deeper understanding of our inner selves. He argues that true happiness and peace arise from within, and that our current technology-driven culture often distracts us from this truth. The episode concludes, as usual, with a discussion on the characteristics of leaders who can navigate the complexities of technology and ethics. Aki advocates for leaders who embrace systems thinking, resilience, and a compassionate approach to both people and the planet. Join us for this enlightening conversation that challenges conventional views on technology and offers a fresh perspective on how we can create a more balanced and meaningful relationship with the digital world. So, let's go! It's great to have you here, Haki. Thank you very much for making the time. And I'm really excited for the conversation of today because uh, I think it's going to go a little bit outside of sort of the, the typical path of, uh, of the podcast, but also I think in a, in a very interesting way. Uh, and I think in a way that it's also, I, it felt necessary, as it felt necessary the first time I, I came across a new or newsletter. Um, so I think the best way to start is introducing yourself uh, to the listeners for the ones who don't know you, uh, and then, yeah, just can't wait to yeah, delve in our conversation. All right. Yeah. First of all, thanks, Grace, for, for the invite, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so, yeah, my name is Aki Järvinen. Uh, I uh, hail from Finland originally, where I uh, spent the first sort of uh, maybe 30 or so years of, of my life and career in technology. Uh, but I do have a background in the humanities, so that might explain some of the sort of leanings that you will hear <laughs> in the rest of the episodes. And I did study philosophy as a, as a minor uh, subject in, in, in the university. But I, um, I have a doctorate uh, actually studying game design, different methods of uh, looking at games, both um, physical and digital, uh, some 15, I don't know, 50 years ago. And, and so I have worked in technology more on the sort of interact media, uh, side of things, uh, for almost, well, more than 20 years, I suppose. And yeah, uh, now currently to make the long story short, um, so I spent time both in the commercial side of things in game studios and so on and so forth, but also in academia across Europe as a researcher and lecturer and so on and so forth. And, uh, and then five years ago, I landed at uh, uh, in the UK uh, or landed in the UK more sort of 10 years ago. But five years ago, I started my day, current day type job in Digital Catapult, where, where we were colleagues, Chris. Uh, and I worked there as sort of different roles having to do with research and R&D and, and as a technologist 
around immersive technologies, especially around uh, virtual and augmented reality and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but today in this podcast, I, I'm very much, I'm not representing my, my employer. I am here as, uh, as my sort of private person who, um, has recently started after a long sort of period of research and, and reading, I guess you could say, uh, my, uh, a newsletter. Yeah, thanks a lot, Aking. And thanks for mentioning that Digital Catapult is where we have met many years ago. But it, it sounded surprising in the sense of when I first saw your newsletter. Because, uh, yes, on the one end, as you mentioned, from my side, I, I'm, uh, I'm used to think uh, of you more as a mixed reality uh, designer and a sort of new experience designer. That's what I, I uh, experienced you professionally. But... On the other end, now, after having uh, sort of read your, your newsletter, and uh, I understand also why kind of design goes beyond the machine and, and really can go one level down or many levels down possibly into really how we think about technologies and how we approach them. Uh, so interestingly enough, I already touched in the past in the podcast sort of more around the ethics of, uh, of technology as an AI. Actually, the first interview with, with Suda uh, Jante, we touched around ethics. Uh, and then recently, I've also interviewed uh, Ricardo Baize, who is, used to be the, the chief scientific officer in, in Yahoo Labs when Yahoo was, uh, was Yahoo. And probably many young people don't even know what Yahoo is. But back in the day, it, it was the search engine before Google for the people who don't know. And and, um, and so we, we definitely touch the different areas. But I think the way you are approaching the problem is much deeper and much more comprehensive. We can say more philosophical. Uh, and so let's start from the name of your, of your newsletter, which is Unexamining Technologies. So what's the problem? Why do we need to examine them? Well, yeah, so, so, so if I uh, explain the, the title on Unexamining Technology, it's sort of draws from um, a famous quote, uh, obviously a translated quote from Socrates uh, from back in back in the sort of classic philosophy days um, uh, and at the root of European civilization who um, who had this quote like that unexamined life is not worth living and uh, and that was in the context of him being uh, persecuted uh, about sort of um, beliefs that were not commonly held and uh and and those included for instance the fact that that philosophy like as so-called love uh, love of wisdom as the etym etymology of the word goes is the sort of the most sophisticated way to live one's life um so so and, and i've sort of made them that parallel here that okay um our contemporary life is definitely immersed in technology and uh, hence any examination of how we live needs to account for our relationship with technology and obviously there's a lot of there's a whole body of 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 history and literature around the philosophy of technology and also philosophy of of how to live a good life from the from the very beginnings of of western and also other eastern Middle Eastern and South, South American philosophy. So what I'm trying to get at is that we, we often take technology as granted in a way and, and, and we don't examine our relationship with technology and therefore we don't necessarily relate in a deep way, examine our relationship or, or our ways of living. And the reason that one of the sort of, um, cultural historians of technology that I like to quote is Langdon Winner, who talks about this um, technological somnambulism, sort of sleepwalking through technologies that have impact and affect our lives. And, 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 and often that happens, uh, we kind of realize those changes only afterwards. So, I mean, I mean, the obvious example at the moment is, is, is for instance, smartphones, which haven't really been around for more than, you know, 15, 16, 17 years in their, in their sort of, uh, current incarnation. And, and then only now for the past few years, we've sort of paid more attention to the private privacy concerns and the different applications that the, the smartphones facilitate having I mean, to do with social media and their impact on 
public debate and and for instance young people's self image and so on and so forth so so we sort of uh awaken to the moral and ethical questions of technologies too late so to speak but also on i would say that on a more sort of industrial level of technology we also build machines and systems that seemingly try to replace nature with technology more and more so we kind of gravitate towards technologies to solve all our problems and and over centuries on the other hand technology in that way has become i would say a very fundamentally human activity but i think also in the process uh, we have sort of lost sight of the limits of technology we always think that there will be uh, more capable technologies and uh and and we don't really see the costs of those technologies so obviously today it's ai in its in a most sort of you know, hype forms around generative AI and large, large language models and so on and so forth. But um, those technology also pose problems having to do with that they are seemingly at least exponentially progressing, but we live on a planet with finite resources. So the question is whether those kinds of technologies can be sustainable. And but nevertheless, we celebrate the tech entrepreneurs who build such technologies that exponentially grab our t- attention. And I think that's one of the things that I also want to draw attention to is is that we pay more attention to technologies that we we maybe should, or the balance isn't quite right. So with my newsletter, I'm trying to sort of uh, explore how might we find you could say like a correctly proportioned attention to technology and sort of ask the right questions rather than having all the answers. Because I do feel that technologies, especially consumer technologies that we, we most of us use every day, they sort of facilitate directing a- attention to matters that are not necessarily conducive to our flourishing as, as human individuals or even collectives or the planet. For that matter, and and I guess that's the my deepest concern uh, with our current relationship and attention towards technologies that it's fundamentally disconnecting us from nature, and it makes us to cling to external things, which technology amplifies. So things out there, and and it draws our attention outwards, whereas. I would argue, and this is obviously not my idea, this is what different philosophies and methods of spiritual practices and so on and so forth have been seeing, saying for centuries that it's inward, uh, the self inquiry and introspection that actually leads you to happiness and peace and feelings of contentness. And those arise from the fact that we are part of nature and we lose, should live in concert with nature. And at the moment, increasingly technology has not led us to a good place around that yeah that's an incredibly broad and dense answer and you covered a lot of ground Uh, and so let me try to unpick it because i think there are a lot of things that we should uh, explore a bit more in detail and i would like to start with one thing you mentioned, uh, which was uh, technology somnambulism, uh, but also something that I picked up in your newsletter that you alluded to, but I wanted to mention more openly. We tend to treat technology as something that has agency of its own, as something that is independent by ourselves as humans, and there is humans and there is technology. Uh, but you alluded to the fact that actually, well, technology is uh, related to humans, is created by humans. And so I'd like to connect it to the running theme of the podcast, which is the one of complexity. And I, I'm trying to understand how to look at that, because the reality is that technology is a social construct. Uh, I like politics and uh, sort of and laws and economics. Those are all social constructs that we sort of more or less explicitly we create uh, and govern, but, but they are social constructs that emerge, as complexity teaches us, emerges from the, from the network uh, of individuals and their own behavior. And so looking from that perspective, uh, we know that 
in that sense, that kind of social construct depends by us. It, it's linked to us because it's, it emerges out of the network that we are part of. So I think the, the, the first question is kind of moving to more of a, an active point of view. It's really like, okay, how can we influence that? Assuming that, well, it has, it, it has its own agency in a way because it behaves and as a, with an emergent behavior, we are part of that as well. So what, what can we do practically? First of all, I, I suppose many technologies try to negotiate the complexity uh, that is sort of surrounding us. So if you think about the complexity of information that we've put into, let's say, the cloud or the internet, then that then often constitutes as a training data for the la large language models and, and produces like an interface, like a natural language interface to that complexity of information. So that just as an example of how I think complexity relates to the sort of aims of people who, who build technology. But the other thing having to do with sort of complexity and emergence that I think are related is, is this this notion often that we, when we see uh, people, um, so so I, I I'm I try to be very careful that I I, I don't talk about technology as a, as a, as a kind of like an agent on its own. I, I try to always say that the people who <laughs> build technology to just to underline that thing that it, technology is built by people uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, but yeah, that was just just a remark. Um, so I was going to talk about the sort of magical qualities of that we often attribute to technologies, and and if you think about emergence and complexity and magic, there are, there's some something sort of related there maybe. And um, so the German philosopher Marty Heidegger wrote some, a little bit about technology in the in the 19th century, and and. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Or the, or the 20th century, I mean. And uh, um, so he used this word, obviously a translation like unveiling, that the technology unveils uh, what is possible in the world so that when we build ships, they sort of unveil the, the seas as shippable. And when we build smartphones or other network technologies, they sort of unveil the connectedness that is that is sort of potentially in in the world between different things. So, and often technologies sort of force something out from nature. So whether it's like forcing, so to speak, uh, plants to grow more quickly so that they would yield more crops and food, or, or whether it's animals. Uh, in in factory farms, and 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 so so in that sense, you know, it, technology sort of taps into the complexity of nature and 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 the cosmos, even in a sense. Um, and I think that those magical qualities are important because they seem to be the ones that capture young minds when people think about careers and what they want to do with their life. And they certainly did for me, you know. Um, I, I, I was totally sort of immersed in video game culture and video games and the worlds that they make, but also other, other kinds of technological in inventions and, and so on and so forth. But lately I've been also think the way that I've, you asked about influencing, uh, so sort of how, how do we sort of almost take back control from technology in a way? I do believe that the process of building and creating technology is is actually the, the the magical thing for those who uh pursue a career in technology the outputs are are part of it but but it's the process of of creating something and therefore i do believe that the the, the mindsets and the world views and the beliefs of the creators will get reflected in the outputs and in the process so therefore, rather than saying that, okay, now uh, we should build technologies that are somehow um, more ethical or more spiritual, I think that's that's not the way to approach it. It's, it's trying to instill that mindset to the people who want to create technologies in the first place so that they would be more aware of uh, these starting points. And unfortunately, I would argue that the the way that let's say engineering has been 
thought for the last decades doesn't really uh, take these things into consideration, at least broadly speaking, don't. Definitely, I'm not promoting any kind of renunciations or from technology. I'm just calling for more sort of sensitive and nuanced way to think about building technology. Because too often techn- technologies uh, sort of become ends in themselves. This relates to what I was said earlier, that they, we think that technology solve alone, almost solve uh, all problems. That, but, but we are, for instance, facing currently problems that are not really problems like climate change. It's not a problem to be solved. It's it's a predicament to be lived with. And that's that's not my, that's Dougal Hines' thought from his book at work in the ruins, which I find very, very sort of uh, insightful. The other thing is then that the magical quality and the want to sort of experience and create that magic often divides people into the makers of technologies and the users of technologies. And what can happen there is is that when there is a technology that sort of all takes over the world, so to speak, as like smartphones and now it seems AI is doing, then there are people who drive that change and that technology and then there are other people who <clears throat> just witness it and and therefore definitely those who are only witnessing for instance being concerned about their jobs because of ai uh, they don't have much agency because we are being told this story now that ai will inevitably you know uh touch all the sectors and all the businesses and trades and so on and so forth. So uh, I'm not just sure how well that answers your question, but uh, yeah, I'll leave it there for now. Well, I think it answered in the best way possible, which is really just showing the so many different implications if you look at this kind of issue uh, from the perspective uh, that you provide and from the lens of sort of, again, complexity and, and emerging behaviors. You touched a few points that are, are very interesting and I'd like to kind of follow up. In particular, when you were talking about magic and magical qualities, it always comes to my mind the quote from, uh, from Arthur C. Clarke that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And one of the questions I constantly pose to myself, to be fair, I feel there is a, an epistemic problem that you, you clearly explain If you are a user, you approach technology as magic. It's something that you don't have any agency. Even if, as we discussed, you actually do because you're you are a user of that. You can decide, for example, not to use it or you can decide to take political actions against it. Uh, so you do have an element of agency as an individual and as a group. But again, treating it as magical There is an element where the lack of knowledge pushes you away and, and creates this feeling of uh, the powerlessness. And on the other end, if you are a maker, you feel you own it because you have a deep knowledge uh, of the technology and, and you bring your worldview. Mm. Uh, and I think there is an intrinsic issue, though, because you alluded to that, the engineering worldview, looking at that with a assuming good intention, it is a worldview that is based on, on rationality and s- tends to interact with, uh, with, with technology, technological artifacts and science from a sort of a moral perspective. Like mm-hmm. I'm building this thing, but with, not with a moral stance, because at least in the current worldview, anything I do and build in a technology and scientific mm-hmm. world doesn't have any moral implications more an ethical implication. But that's not really the case. So how would you look at this epistemic problem that you have from the sort of the maker side and the user side and the way they look and influence technology? I think this is a problem that has rapidly sort of increased uh, in the recent decades, well, or almost for the last century in the sense that because the advancement of technology in many fields are is so rapid uh what it also means that the unforeseen consequences have become sort of more prevalent because the the sort of the, the technological sort of system just keeps rolling on and obviously now ai is at the center of 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 this discussion because it's such a black box in many many cases the ai solutions that even their creators don't quite understand how they uh end up uh 
you know, producing the outputs that they do. But this is where the history of technology, I think, can be illuminating in the sense that when um, back when we had sort of, we, we didn't have digital technologies, but we had mechanical devices, whether they were plows or even steam engines, even a lay person could sort of, sort of see how they operate, like that, okay, the steam pushes the, the train forward and, and there's there's certain propulsion and, and, and all that kind of stuff. And now, obviously, we have more and more technologies that very few people understand how they work, even as technologists. I mean, we might understand one part of how, how stuff works, but in a like a smartphone, there are other many other components that I, I don't understand how they work. So there's an increased specialization, which sort of reinforces that sort of makers and users dichotomy and dynamic. And then because technology has, there has this tendency to, to miniaturize, to become smaller when it becomes more sort of accessible. So that has led to this current situation where, you know, chips and processors and circuit boards are, are sort of magical to most people. And Typically, we don't even see them. They are inside a case. Uh, and and then, obviously, we are going towards quantum technologies, which are even more you know, <laughs> incomprehensible for, to most people. And so, so, therefore, the magical qualities sort of become even more apparent because they are just like, you know, I uh, have no clue how this works, but it creates these, these useful things. Uh, and, and in some ways, then you could argue that engineers and, and software developers, hardware developers have become like, if not magicians, then alchemists of today. They just put some, you know, stuff together and, and, and it works. But I do think that then if we elevate them to that kind of a position or we sort of look, you know, at that kind of a position from afar without really understanding what is going on, it sort of lends itself to less scrutiny. And the temptation to sort of overlook the moral concerns also from the developers creator side is because the technology itself is so fascinating. It's sort of an intellectual puzzle to be solved. But then you, in that fascination, you might forget to ask that to what, what end and do we actually, who actually needs this technology? Is it, is it good? And, and I've tried to sort of negotiate this sort of dilemma of both engaging with technology, but also developing this, you could say, like a learned ignorance towards it by this notion of critical technical awakenings, which is based on an earlier uh, approach by Philip Agre, who was uh, an AI scholar back in the 90s and has written about this. And he, he wrote about so-called critical technical practices, where which was a result from himself awakening to the sort of seeing the limits of the technical, empirical, and you could say like hyper rational way of looking at the world and those technical problems, and that sort of leads easily to the to that mindset where every problem is a problem to be solved with technology. So what I'm what I'm trying to explore and sort of suggest is following these people that I mentioned that okay, how could we? What, what would be, for instance, the concepts and aspirations from spiritual traditions that we could instill into technology development to guide and sort of uh, steward uh, technology development from a more sort of uh, nuanced understanding of what nature is, who we are as part of nature, and so on and so forth. Let's move one step forward. Looking from the lenses of... Uh of spirituality and technology together. I've seen in your newsletter, you alluding to the creation of new foundations and the possibility of, of actually the foundation of, of a new civilization that can sort of overcome these problems that we just touched. Is this new foundation completely deprived of technology as you see that at the moment or from, from the different sources? Or is it a foundation that still uses technology, maybe some of these technologies to understand, it would be interesting to understand what they would be, but has a different relationship with them. How this new foundation would look like? Yeah, so, so first of all, like, um, I feel that I need to sort of give a little bit more context to this, which is that there are def definitely people like philosophers and thinkers out there who uh, talk about that we are sort of in, in a time between worlds, uh, meaning that if we look back at history, there's, there's many ancient civilizations that have, 
you know, risen and fallen. That tends to be, seems to be uh, a characteristic of a civilization. And, and, and when a civilization ends, it doesn't need to end like in a super dramatic way. It sort of peters out possibly. So what I'm saying here is that if we need like the building blocks for a new civilization, it, it doesn't implicate any sort of uh, apocalyptic event necessarily. But given that we are realistically looking at 2.5 degrees of, of, of raise in, in, in the global average temperature, something needs to happen. Then the question is that, okay, how could we build, start building on the sort of ruins of this civilization, which through different twists and turns has led to us this situation, which technologies would still be useful and sort of in a, in a way help to rebuild and take some things from the ruins of the civilization in a, in a positive and productive way. I do not claim to know what these technologies are. And I think at this point, it's more important to ask the question today because it would be quite sort of a demonstration of hubris if I would claim to know what these technologies are. But I do think that what we do know is that, or I, I would argue and suggest that the incentives to build more technology that sort of tries to maximize the exploitation of natural resources, for instance, should be realigned with nature and, and its limits. And uh, and I think this is where, for instance, indigenous thinking might show us the way in, in how to build technologies that actually respect nature and help us realize that what we take away from nature, we also take away from ourselves uh, because we are part of nature. But this seems to be something that the tech entrepreneurs of today seem to forget. They try to sort of surpass nature. So I think even more important than the the actual specific technologies at the sort of foundation of a new civilization are the people who are capable to work with technologies to sort of implement this change. And uh, people who are, understand that technology alone and by themselves do not fix anything. But some of the issues like, well, I'm especially talking about climate change, but we also have other crises going on in the world having to do with the economy and different increasing number of wars, for instance, that again, that they are sort of, we are at the predicament rather than a problem that can be fixed with technology. Yeah, so the question for instance is, as I alluded before that, okay, what kinds of skills and tools, some of them might be technologies are needed to live with global temperature rise, for instance. And I think what makes this critical is that the sad news is that I don't think that our current educational systems prepare our children and young people to deal with this. They mostly prepare uh, people for the markets that have brought us here to the sort of economical dynamics and technology plays a part in that. So what I want to promote is this idea of, of, of how can we use technology for human flourishing and the flourishing idea includes, for instance, that we don't just sort of treat people, for instance, with t medical technologies to get them back to contribute to the markets and serve them, but to somehow support them in, in a more humane way. A topic that you alluded to earlier, and I see kind of coming back, and I would like to kind of put it on the, on the spotlight, is, is ethics. And reason being because you allude to, to education, uh, you alluded before around sort of the approach and behaviors of, of the makers, as you, as you call them. And so the feel is that there is a need of uh, a deep ethical rethinking of how we do things and how we approach things. And at the moment, we, we tend to give ethics for granted in a lot of areas, in a good way, in the sense that people might decide to skip ethics and say, I want to behave unethically for whatever personal reasons, but they know that they are doing it. But when it comes to technology, the feeling is that ethics is kind of a relatively new field and people talk about that sometimes a bit more, as we can call it, a bit of a, we can call it ethic washing more than actual doing something for real. Uh, well, I know there are other people doing something for real, but some companies, at least the feeling is that they try to check the box more than anything else. Mm, yeah. And so I really like to understand from your perspective is, is whether from the educational side, but also maybe also from the, the current things that are going on, how we can 
embed ethics more deeply into the process of the creation of technology? I think this issue goes beyond technology. Uh, I, I do think that we struggle to apply ethics into anything these days. And and that is which is quite a bleak uh, outset. But still, I, I do think that at least in the, in the sort of broadly speaking, the Western nation states and so on and so forth, we are conditioned to certain kind of individualism. And uh, and there is a certain value in that for young people so that they gain like a sense of agency in the world, for instance. But um, after a certain amount of life experience, I, I do think that we should strive to serve others selflessly rather than serve ourselves. And, and this includes serving uh, non-human uh, living beings as well and the planet. And the fact that the question of ethics and morals becomes quite tangible with technologies that technology just has been harnessed in so many ways to uh, in our life to our lives and and as I've said quite a few times also to the ways to exploit nature. So therefore, the, the sort of I think the ethical questions that sort of reach the sort of headlines in mainstream news outlets ha- often have to do which either nature of human nature, like this, this debates about geoengineering and then obviously AI and, and so on and so forth. But I've been sort of quite a bit emphasizing the, the relationship between technology and nature and how, how we have sort of over-exploited and are over-exploiting nature with technology, but we are also using technology with financial incentives to, to uh, exploit fellow human beings. Um, with, latest example is is the ghost work that goes into AI development in the global south by people labeling images and so on and so forth so that the trading data actually can do what what the creators want it to do. So at the end of the day for me, ethics is about moral acts towards other living beings and 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 therefore what we've sort of arrived at the situation that this is for instance what the philosopher Hans Jonas um he, he was a German philosopher who wrote about how the reach of ethics has changed through technology. So that before, like 100 years ago, 200 years ago, moral dilemmas had to do with physical confrontations with people, individual collectives. But now, because we are in this connected world through technology, we are, the reach of ethical questions is, is sort of global in a sense, or it can connect the dilemma might be, you know, uh, between individual or collectives around different parts of the of the globe, and therefore they become at at the same time more frequent, but also more complex in the sense that there's not an embodied experience of the other, and of course this explains much of the sort of volatile nature of online, you know, discussions and and conversations, which tend to be not not very productive they are almost like debate for its own sake thank you and yeah of course ethics per se it's a huge topic and but it was interesting to to look at it from from this this different perspective you are providing now i would like to cover another of the topic that you you mentioned at the beginning and i want to actually sort of continue some of the things you said in in, in this in the last question because you talked about individuals you talked about kind of selfishness uh, versus selflessness but i think the implication is that we need to have a different relationship with ourselves if we also want to relate with the rest of the world and with technologies in, in a different way uh, we need to to look at ourselves uh, differently i mentioned it a few times a few well, probably more than one year ago now the guardian came up with a, with a nice article kind of saying the two topics that should be taught at school and they are not one is complexity. Well, I was happy. And the other one was self-awareness. And, and I think that's related a lot to some of the things you talked about, mindfulness and spirituality and kind of recreating this personal dimension in a different perspective, which is not just kind of the personal success, but more about really the, the relationship with ourselves and our minds and understand how we, we place ourselves into the world. I know you touched this topic quite a few times in your newsletters. What's your point of view on, on this front? So as I, I think I mentioned already, the culture of 
consumption, for instance, and, and whether it's physical goods or, for instance, online services, social media and such, is, is that the constant keeps on telling us that happiness lies like elsewhere. It lies in, you know, more expensive uh, X, Y, and Z and more wealth and uh, external things in general. But increasingly, we also hear about people who get all that wealth and then they just move the goalposts because that doesn't seem to bring bring happiness or, or peace. For me, the clear implication and is is that it's it's self inquiry, it's introspection that can awaken you to the sort of peace and happiness at the ground of your pe- being. And this is where spiritual traditions mostly get sort of associated with Eastern Eastern philosophies and and, and religious. But but there are also uh, similar aspects to many Western and Christian, for instance, uh, traditions and. At the end of the day, this is what I'm sort of trying to leverage or sort of get the inspiration from when I talk about sort of the more awakened way to think about technology design and development that, okay, currently I'm working on this model as a modest proposal of what would it mean to design and develop technologies from, let's say, a transcendental point of view where you design away from certain things that are opposite to trans- transcendence. For instance, you design away from cynicism, you design away from nihilism, which are basically ways that are uh, all sort of worldviews or approaches where we don't either question any deeper meanings or don't see meaning in existence and our world at, at all. And for instance, we think about what I just said about the sort of nature of quote discussion um, online, which tends to be quite volatile and and filled with righteousness and and what quite divisive, um, it seems that in a, uh, inadvertently these platforms feed like quite cynical and almost nihilistic worldviews, and therefore it's definitely not an easy task to sort of turn the clock around or, or the turn the sort of uh, perspective around that, okay, how might we make, let's say, social media platforms that are somehow more spiritual in nature? At the end of the day, it, it it's about people who engage with those platforms. But that's why I'm, as I said before, I'm trying to sort of see that, okay, how, how could we create a cohort or maybe even a generation of technologists who Uh, are more uh, open and aware of the different traditions that uh, look at self-inquiry introspection as the ground of being and happiness and peace. Uh, And and, and then how could those kinds of mindsets and worldviews uh, influence the types of technologies that they build going forward? But so all of this really comes down to like identifying with certain types of uh, things that we've been more or less conditioned to that, okay, we we need to build a career, we need to do this and that to appear in a certain social standing. And, and all of those, if you go really to the other extreme in this kind of thinking, are sort of illusions that uh, they don't bring you happiness. They might give you agency in the current world, but they don't really uh, go beyond that. And you might then end up in your later years sort of uh, discovering that is this all that there was to this? I found very interesting. First of all, like how we started the journey talking about your, your background as, as designer. And even if apparently this conversation were moving us away, the designer mindset came back really from the perspective, okay, okay how can we design technologies taking these dimensions in mind. That was very, very powerful to me because it gives a call to action. Yeah, and I would just add that we touched on ethics and, and, and so on and so forth. So there's definitely more and and people are more aware of different, let's say, design and development frameworks out there that try to instill like ethical p- viewpoints and and try to... Uh, for instance, foster responsible innovation, as as it's being called, and and try to sort of design away from from possible harms. 
But what I haven't yet come across is similar framework that would take spiritual traditions uh, into account in this. And that's kind of like my, if, if there's anything unique in what I'm trying to build here from that technology sort of design point of view, that's, that's what I'm trying to bring into the equation. Okay. How can you do responsible innovation or sort of ethically aware technology development drawing and being inspired by uh, spiritual uh, uh, traditions? That's a very, very powerful point because I think we tend to look again at technology from a rationalist mindset. And while being myself kind of start coming from this rationalist background, uh, I understand why we, we want to assume that, okay, we can have a rational, ethical behavior and the two words goes together. And that's a fact. But if you look carefully, though, and you touched, for example, in the Western culture, you, you put the, the connection to Christianity. The reality is, historically, we, the ethical frameworks have been developed within sort of, let's call them spiritual frameworks, that if in a the very generic way. Usually, spiritual frameworks are religious, but not always. Uh, and I think... The element of awakening, which is something that I can, I can personally relate, which is one of the things actually that sort of hooked, at least in my personal experience, if I can share to your newsletter, the element of awakening is an element where you can start to understand that being rational, even if powerful, it's not all that is. And you don't abandon, I would say, your scientific and technological mindset, even if you go beyond that purely rationalist approach. And, and spirituality, you know, is not a bad word. Uh, it is something that can give you other ideas without necessarily kind of lose yourself or going into some of, uh, I don't know, fluffy mumbo jumbo, which all, you know, technical people tend to be afraid of when you talk, we use the word spirituality. One of my sort of big inspirations for this work, which is Ian Mick, McCleal Christ um, hemisphere hypothesis, which is basically his research around the two hemispheres of the brain and how they they direct attention in different ways to the world and create sort of a different stance to how how we see the world and and the long of the short is is that uh, that the left hemisphere tends to see things like in isolation. Uh, uh, it tends to label things and it doesn't necessarily see the bigger picture and and it also, also only tends to see the sort of functional uh, nature of things, whereas the right hemisphere then sort of completes the picture, sees things in connection, in relation to everything and, and sees, sees doesn't uh, label things because it doesn't really work with language as the left one does. The right use is, is more prevalent or... Um, caters towards me- use of metaphors and so on and so forth. And and the summary here is that the technology development that we've been d- discussing today is sort of a result of a very left hemisphere dominated worldview. And, and in a similar fashion, as I'm not saying that we need to do away with rational thinking, we definitely need rational thinking, but that to also realize the limits of rational thinking in certain aspects and and uh, open our minds to sort of more figurative, symbolic, metaphoric things uh, that that cannot be put into words. And for instance, have to do with intuition and how we sort of get these in- intuitions of insights and stuff that that had explains quite a few scientific discoveries, for instance. So yeah, that's just a very short crash course to the hemisphere hypothesis, but. Uh, if you're interested in how I apply that, you can you can read more in my newsletter. And you touched upon a lot of scientific discoveries came out of this sort of intuition mindset, and we can just kind of mention all the all the thought experiments, for example, that helped Einstein to come up with most of his ideas. Uh, and so, intuition is a global picture view and is a fundamental part in the process of creation and we shouldn't discount it because it cannot be always rationally explained. Um, so I'm, I'm completely supportive of what you said and I think it, it's a very, very important uh, lesson uh, for everybody who wants to approach uh, technology from a different perspective. What you said now and also you referred quite a few times to education, it kind of leads nicely to the, the usual final question for this podcast that it can be probably a little bit tweaked and so looking from the perspective of the new generation that we want to create, and hopefully this new generation is not just the new technologists coming in, but also people right now that they want to evolve, that they want to become, 
awakened, as you said, uh, what are the characteristics of a leader who embraces complexity and who is able to examine technology properly? Well, I think, first of all, relating to what we've discussed, I think such leaders need to be open to sort of different ways of knowing other than the the sort of technical, empirical, rational ways of knowing. There are embodied ways of knowing that, for instance, have the potential to connect us to insights and intuitions and nature in a, in a different way than the more sort of uh, hyper-rational ways. But I do think that leaders in the space have, especially sort of relating to technology development and, and deployment, that they always understand that that happens in a in in diverse contexts of culture and economy and politics and environment and even religion. That's one thing. And in order to sort of make any sense out of that complexity, they need to embrace systems thinking. But I, I found, for instance, like I am also, I think in the past have been guilty of this myself that systems thinking can be the sort of uh, intellectual aspect to it that you can you can approach it from an intellectual curiosity point of view how how can i make sense of these systems oh this is fascinating but i think the system thinking that i i would want to promote is is the right hemisphere driven desire to understand the holes and try to even see like second or third degree consequences for for whatever you're building. And that's, of course, very dif- difficult. But had we practiced that more, maybe we wouldn't be in the in the different crises that we are uh, as, a, as a planet at the moment. And I think that relates to sort of the other ways of knowing that I mentioned also is that this understanding or acceptance that everything is changing all the time. And that is fine. And one shouldn't really resist that because it just seems to be an underlying uh, law of nature and the universe, really. And with that all, I would promote or ask for or encourage building resilience and calm through reflection, anticipation and, and, and responsiveness to change. And then those things of having to do with intros- introspection and self-inquiry help in that. And at the end of the day, I think any leader or any person really in the world, there's a, there's a very high bar I think this quote is from Dalai Lama, who once says that he, he tries to approach every single person as they would be your old friend. Uh, and, and certainly I can't say that I, I uh, am able to do that every day or even every week, but it is a high bar to strive for. And essentially it's it's about showing up uh, with certain kind of love and kindness and respect and showing up. Uh, that's one part of the equation. And then, uh, showing up with love and kindness is is the second part, and I think every leader could uh, benefit from from that. Thanks a lot, Aki. That was uh, that was beautiful, and uh, and a lot of very interesting inputs and hints for our listeners to to explore and grow. So yeah, thank you very much for that. Before we close down, just to make sure that that everybody knows how we can reach out and and find out more. So the your newsletter is called Unexamined Technologies and it is available on Substack. And is there any other way for the, the listener to sort of follow you and reach out to you? You can find me on LinkedIn, but Substack is the platform where my uh, newsletter resides. So if you search Substack for Unexamined Technology, that's the main source. So I'm sure more people will follow you and I will keep following you because I'm curious to find out about the next steps. So- so thanks a lot again, Aki. It was really a pleasure and I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you, Chris. It was a pleasure. Thanks for listening to this episode of Angels of Creation. I hope you enjoyed our deep dive into the ethics and philosophy of technology with Aki Yarvinen and discover how we can reframe our relationship with technology and explore ideas from spiritual traditions to guide innovation. If you want to learn more, be sure to follow Angels of Creation and leave us a rating and a review. And don't hesitate to share this episode on social media and with friends and colleagues who might be interested. This podcast counts on you to grow and help other people to understand and embrace complexity, to innovate and create. If you have any questions, comments or feedback, feel free to reach out to angelsofcreation at I'll be glad to continue the conversation. <music>